2014, and it's uh, great to be in uh, San Pedro. Very great to be uh, at the Port of Los Angeles and see many friends, both those who work for the city of Los Angeles and the Port of Los Angeles and those who live here. I'm joined by the great councilman, Joe Buscaino, who I'm so proud of your family and your, your work that you've done following those big shoes that Janice Hahn. High heels. Uh, high heels, man. I, you know, but uh, <laughs> where is it? Good job. Give, big, give it up for Big Joe. Thank you. Before we get on with the port business, I do want to call uh, the airport issues up real quick so that we could get those handled so you get back to LAX. Um, <laughs> let's just saw the airport issues. We could. Yes. Uh, under item 7, the Board of Airport Commissioners submits for council approval the second amendment to the concession agreement with the joint venture for the operation of the advertising concession at Lawa LLC, also known as JC Deco Airport Inc., which is an exclusive contract for the provision of all advertising at LAX and Ontario International. Now that Lawa has awarded a separate terminal media operator contract for all advertising at LAX to JC Deco Airport, the proposed Second Amendment to the agreement with the joint venture would remove all references to advertising locations at LAX as of February 1, 2014, and would reduce the minimum annual guarantee to $250,000. Also, the CAO has submitted a report and recommendation to the mayor on this matter. Madam CAO. recommend approval, Andrew Mills CAO office. The only thing I would add is that the um, minimum guarantee of 250,000 was based upon the um, work that airports staff did in historical references. Very good, and Mr. Adams? Mark Adams, Los Angeles World Airports. Uh, this would, this, as the Chief Legislative Analyst Representative indicated, this would continue the advertising program in Ontario and we ask for your approval. Absolutely. Mr. Bruce, I know. Good. Uh, approved. Next item. Under item 8, the Board of Airport Commissioners submits for approval a concession agreement with ABM Parking Services to provide transportation and parking management services for the employee parking lots at LAX. Also provide design, installation, and maintenance of a new turnkey parking access control system at LAX's remote employee parking lots and provide shuttle transportation services between Metro's Green Line Station and the Central Terminal Area at LAX. And the CAO has submitted a report and recommendation to the mayor on this matter. Thank you, Andrea Mills CAO Office. I would just like to add that um, following discussion with airport staff, it was determined that this request will be um, submitted to council under section charter section 606 and secondly that um, in addition to what the CLA has mentioned this particular um, contractor will service 6,300 parking spaces and will utilize 29 buses to transport the okay. riders we recommend approval very good mr. Adams Mark Adams, Los Angeles Port Airports. Um, yeah, the, this is basically to operate our employee parking lots that the airline employees and concessionaires and such would use um, and provide shuttle services for those employees to the terminal. Okay, area. Mr. Buscaino. Uh, this lot is owned by LAWA? Correct. Okay. I recommend approval. Thank you, Mr. Buscaino. Second all the way. So ordered. We thank the airport. Get back to the airport. Keep it working safely and uh, appreciate all the hard work you and Marie Lindsay and others are doing out there uh, all the way through. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Buscaino, I'd like to now ask that the ambassador, uh, Ms. Martinez, come, the president of the Port of Los Angeles, as well as uh, Gary Lee Moore, the acting director, feel comfortable. You could sit down or however you want to do it. But it before is you make your remarks, I want to welcome you because. You live in my district, and Mr. Yeah, Garcetti, Mr. Garcetti chose a great one from my district. And having been an ambassador and a diplomat, you have a great understanding of the world. And I think the Port of Los Angeles is the world port. Cynthia Ruiz, as you're so 
aptly say, and all the keys that go from everybody doing the work that's here. So before you make your remarks, though, what is great is whether whatever part of the city you're in, there's someone who cares deeply about all things, but especially the Port of Los Santos and San Pedro. I'm going to ask Mr. Buscaino to, uh, I had to introduce my constituent, but I want you to say <laughs> a few words right now. Joe Buscaino. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for agreeing to, to have the, we'll do it again. the TCT committee meeting here in the Harbor area. I want to thank uh, Gary Lee Moore and the entire Port of Los Angeles family for being such great hosts. Thank you so much. And to our residents, our community-based organization, labor, business members, um, thank you for being here as well. What we're going to hear uh, today, um, the agenda before you, um, a lot of information on um, ensuring that uh, the Port of Los Angeles remains the number one cargo container uh, in the country but also um, the importance of making sure that this port is also a people port as well with our um, waterfront redevelopment efforts. Um, we're also going to uh, hear um, on the efficiencies, looking at the efficiencies of the Port of Los Angeles, um, looking at um, technology that's going to be before us and how we're going to um, use our workforce to encourage them and also to encourage our, our, our business partners to train our workforce when it comes to that. But this is a great opportunity, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much. I think uh, I would like this. to come down here uh, another twice a year at least, or even more if we uh, have an agenda item, which is so important. Fantastic. Good movement is so important. And, the, and the, as deep as the port of Los Angeles is, it's deeply into every neighborhood in Los Angeles and Southern California. So it's not just the city, but all over. And the one item I will ask you, I think we should have a discussion. I like competition, and I think I like Long Beach. I like Los Angeles. I don't know if it works if we're together, even though that was one of the commissions. So I want to talk Great. to you about that. Maybe we should have that lengthy discussion so we give a full uh, okay, thing at some item. But, uh, Madam Ambassador, please. I simply want to say, on behalf of the Board of Harbor Commissioners and the Port of Los Angeles, welcome to our meeting room. May you have a productive and happy meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Ambassador Martinez for Mayor, shortest speech. Give her a hand. <laughs> Councilmember Labonge and Councilmember Buscaino, uh, we appreciate the thoughtfulness that, uh, and Councilman Bonin, the thoughtfulness that you three dedicate to our issues and bring. We have a number before you today. And, you know, I just want to share that uh, we're very pleased that uh, the shipping companies continue to see the value in the Port of Los Angeles. And in the first three months of this year, as compared to 2013, we're up over 4% in increased cargo. So uh, we don't know if that's a trend, but we sure like it, you know. And so it's very exciting. The men and women uh, are so dedicated to, perform, uh, to delivering those projects and services and security necessary that people feel comfortable in coming here. So on behalf of all of us, thank you for coming. Did you want to do... You want to do item, item number two. Item two, the Board of Harbor Commissioner submits for council approval a foreign trade zone operating agreement with Agility Logistics Corporation for the operation under foreign trade zone rules of foreign trade zone number 202, site 11B, located in Carson, California. The agreement would have an initial term of five years with three renewal options for five years each for a potential maximum term of 20 years. The CAO has submitted a report and recommendation to the mayor on this matter. Uh, Alvin Newman, CAO's office. We agree with the CLA's assessment and we recommend approval. Mike, Mike DiBernardo with the Port of Los Angeles. This is for Agility, as was mentioned, and uh, they are located in Carson, north of the 405 and west of the 710. Mr. Chair, if I may, Mike, just for the public knowledge, explain to us and those members here who uh, rarely get an opportunity to visit uh, the TCT committee what an FTZ is. Uh, actually, an FTZ allows the importers to either defer their duties with U.S. Customs. It's a, it's a government program, and we've actually been in the program for about 25 years. We're going to be celebrating our 25th anniversary a little later this year. And it basically is a government program that allows importers to uh, defer duties or pay them after they are moved out of the zone and into the into the marketplace. If they re-export them, actually those duties are not uh, 
are not paid. So they can do some manipulation to cargo and then re-export it out of there and duties uh, are not paid. So in a nutshell, that's what a foreign trade zone is. Celebrate that, Michael. On the 20th anniversary, we want to make sure the commission's involved to voice it. And I don't know how you want to do it, whether you want to invite, maybe check with Mayor Garcetti's office. I don't know if the deputy mayor is here. Invite the mayor down here to invite the mayors of all these towns, whether it's Carson or San Bernardino, where, Riverside, wherever you are, to the importance of this and make it a big day because well, I think it's so important to people know. Because the other thing, too, with this program, I see Norman Arakawa, who's always a champion for the port. Thank you, Norman. The situation that people see this as an opportunity to maybe do something, the next step in their business, not realizing this is available. So I know you put the paper, the ads in the local paper or the yes. awareness, so this is very good. So Mr. Busca, you know, is very proud of it. I'm proud of it. Yes. So uh, onward and upward. So okay. uh, approval. And item three. The Board of Harbor Commissioners submits for approval the second amendment to Foreign Trade Zone Operating Agreement with Howard Hartree Incorporated, which is a contract for the operation of a Foreign Trade Zone warehouse and office at Site 27 located in Wilmington in the City of Los Angeles. The proposed amendment would exercise the first renewal option to extend the term for another five years beginning on May 1st, 2014 and ending on April 30th, 2019. The CAO has submitted a report and recommendation to the mayor on this matter. Uh, Alvin Newman, CAO's office. We concur with the CLA's assessment and we recommend approval. Yes, and this is for a renewal for Howard Hartree located in Wilmington. They're north of Harry Bridges and east of Freeze Avenue. Move to approve. Thank you. Okay. Under item one, we have a presentation by the Harbor Department on its Trade Connect program, which provides education and training to small and mid sized businesses on the process and requirements of exporting goods and services to international markets. Good afternoon, Councilman Labonge and Councilman Busca. You know, it's good to see you today and it's my pleasure this afternoon to give you a very brief update because I know time is of the essence for you with all the items you have before you but we'd like to give you a brief summary of our trade development initiatives of which uh, Trade Connect is our flagship and but first before I do that I'd like to uh, introduce my colleagues uh, Norman Arakawa and Jean Coronel back there who are waving who uh, through their hard work make these programs possible. So to explain the background of the program, I think it might uh, be good to explain briefly why exporting of the goods and services of LA and the LA region are important for our city and our port, and then briefly explain the challenges and opportunities that we face. So first we might ask, show me the money. What is the actual direct dollar value of exports uh, to the LA Customs District and I'd like to show you this because I think you'll find it interesting because in the year 2013 we had a record year of exports of 127 billion dollars that was almost a 5% increase now that I must say is through the gate what we call the gateway that's both the port and the airport so it shows a, a, a very strong record in history but imports still dominate with over two to one so that basically gives us a challenge. So what are some of the advantages that we have here? Well, first, the, our region is still the largest manufacturing center in the United States. And exports provide a market diversification for our companies in our region. So really, export development is a form of economic development. So to come back to the port, why is exporting important for the port? Well, first of all, as you know, the container ships are growing. The ships come in full, but when they leave the port, they've got 55 or 60 percent empty. So the most efficient use of our ships and containers and port equipment would be if we had ideally at balanced loads. So what are some of our advantages? Well, in the San Pedro Bay ports, we have over 80 sailings a week to the Pacific Rim. That includes Asia and Latin America. And we have 13 container lines that fight for companies' businesses. That means equipment availability, good export rates. 
and we have the greatest number of logistics and distribution centers in the entire United States, so it's an ideal platform for distribution. And of course, you know about our great rail links to 14 regional U.S. markets, and our, we just talked about our foreign trade zone. Some other advantages are that we have, as a result of all these sailings, the greatest number of origin and destination ports of call. That means more destinations for U.S. companies wanting to export made in America goods. So we're number one customs district in the United States for both air and sea cargo. But I'm just here to say that being number one brings some great advantages. As well as being our largest employment sector, we have a huge number of specialized service companies with professionals with linguistic and international skills that we can leverage to increase trade. And we have a, a thousand flights per day at the, at the airport as well as a hundred trains a day through the uh, port complex. So as a result, we're, we handle a third of U.S. global trade, so why not leverage that for economic development? I put here very quickly a 2010 figures uh, showing what our main markets are. Now, it doesn't include Latin America because they're rapidly growing uh, up the chart. But I wanted to point out that in 2010, we basically rebounded from the recession. This is a great leading indicator. So we lost a huge amount of cargo during the recession, and we bounced back in 2010. Now, for example, we're even gone higher. China, which was 144, is now 159. But this is good news. The other piece of good news from this chart is that we're seeing increased diversification, particularly to Southeast Asia. Here are top exports. If you think that it's just scrap paper and scrap metal, actually we have a, an eclectic mix of commodities that move at very high value in some cases, for example, civilian aircraft parts and diamonds. But diamonds don't move by the port, they move by the airport, as you might imagine. So I, I just put those chart, this chart up here to show the eclectic diversity of our exports from our region. So what are some more advantages? Well, when the President signed the U.S.-Korea Free Trade Agreement, this gave a terrific boost to us because it brought tariffs for California wine and uh, citrus products, nuts, for example, down from 35 to 45 percent tariff to zero overnight. And with the new Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership, which covers about 40 percent of world GDP, we're also going to have a tremendous advantage for our region. So bottom line, California will be the largest U.S. beneficiary of these U.S. free trade agreements. So after we've seen the opportunities, what are the challenges? Well, of course, we have to keep investing in infrastructure. We have to keep our costs competitive. But we're going to talk briefly about education. Eighty-five percent of California manufacturers don't export. And ninety-five percent of consumers are projected to be outside the U.S. in the coming decade. And 80% of economic growth will also be outside the U.S. All the more reason that exports will be the driver for the next economy. So now coming back to our program, local companies have fears. When we surveyed them, they said, I, I don't know how I'm going to get paid. I don't know how I'm going to find reliable customers and distributors. Which country should I start with? Is someone going to steal my intellectual property? And I don't have staff to do the documentation. So these are some basic elements that we address for the small business community. We started with an introductory workshop, and we worked our way up to topic-specific, market-specific products and an, and an advanced course that has a series of 10 in-depth programs. Who are our partners? Well, government at all levels, the LA City Council, we try to reach out to every council district. Los Angeles World Airports is a, has been a close and hardworking partner since day one. Mayor's Office of International Trade, also the Economic and Workforce Development, and the Minority Business Development Agency. But at the state, we have cooperation from the Governor's Business Office, and of course our main presenters are from the federal agencies of the Department of Commerce, SBA, and EXIM. And who are our hosts? Local chambers and ethnic chambers primarily, as well as professional uh, groups. So this gives you a, just a flavor of... Yeah. I was testing Gary's hearing. Good job, Gary. <laughs> Southern California Association of Governments, SCAG. Do you know about them? Yes, I know about them. Uh, they should be a partner organization. That goes for the Inland Empire, all the, from Ventura County to San Bernardino. I'll introduce you to the head guy. I appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I know for a fact they, the port's working with SCAG. 
Um, I've not seen, on his report. We wanted to report there. detail. <laughs> the, the executive director of SCAG uh, mentions the how, what an awesome responsibility we have in moving goods here, and how each um, cargo, each can hits every congressional district in this country. So we know the. I got it, but I want to see it listed, and also maybe yes. we could have a SCAG meeting down here just so that people know the importance. And let Long Beach share in it, too. You guys get along, don't you? Yeah. Okay, good. And SCAG would open up a door to rolling our program throughout Southern That's California. That's your yes. okay. So here's some of the partners, a uh, colorful slide. And here's, uh, you might recognize one of the individuals in this photo. Joe's in this photo. <laughs> Joe's so no, this actually, is the councilman, the chairman, arranged this photo. Uh, with the whole <laughs> right, it worked. So this is an example of us trying to welcome the trade ministers from our main trading yeah. partners. And uh, one of the programs that we're having coming up at the airport in Council District 11 is uh, our export workshop for aerospace suppliers. But you might also rec recognize another council member up yeah. here with the mayor of Huntington Park at our bilingual Spanish English Harvard program. College. <laughs> yeah. Harvard College. So. Good. Here's just a quick list of how we've increased the number of programs uh, from initially 7 to 63 in the last number of years and increased our attendees. And we've pleased to say we won some awards, the Presidential A-Star Award, the LA Quality and Productivity Commission in November, and the National Association of Small Business uh, International Trade Educators, as well as awards from uh, the Department of Commerce. So I'd like Trade to Connect is the port's pioneering program to turn yeah. entrepreneurs into exporters, and it's having a positive impact on the economy. What Trade Connect does is actually connect small businesses with the resources uh, that the port has in terms of teaching them, helping them, holding their hand uh, to get them to understand that by exporting their goods and services, uh, they really have a greater opportunity uh, to succeed. The Trade Connect is an export education program and it's a very simple one because it brings together the experts in international trade to help connect the companies to the resources they need to export. We manufacture Asian and multi-ethnic fusion sauces. We got the call from Dubai saying, we love your products, we want them. It became a research question. How are we going to export? What does it take? And that's where Trade Connect came to my rescue. So in essence, Trade Connect is a coaching program where we connect the merchants and entrepreneurs to new markets overseas. I learned how to ship, how to find the freight forwarders, how to find the trading partners on the other end. Getting those resources and those working tools have made exporting these products so easy and successful. Port officials, often joined by U.S. Department of Commerce and Export-Import Bank representatives, explain trends, provide resources, and suggest contacts. Business people participate to learn about overseas markets, as well as logistics, regulations, and financing. Last year, I needed to know about more about export financing, and it was perfect because that's what I focused on. The first shipment that I did, it took nine months to get paid. Second one, it took six months to get paid. Really, I have... I, my business is much more profitable in the exporting because of Trade Connect. Trade Connect has helped probably over 6,000 entrepreneurs in the past seven years, and we hope to reach out to many more of them. It has grown our business from shipping to one country to shipping to five countries thanks to Trade Connect. International business is a bright spot for California as the Golden State's annual exports total about $160 billion, a 25% increase since 2009. Leading the way are computer and electronic products, transportation equipment, machinery, manufactured items, and chemicals. Trade Connect is about fostering a new global view for American businesses, to see the world as one marketplace, and it's working. The President of the United States gives an award to the top export service companies called the E-Star Award, and we're very pleased to have won that award on May 20th. And the port's winning approach, innovative thinking, superior logistics, and railway and highway connections to major U.S. markets make it the perfect gateway to ship abroad. Thank you very much, Councilman. Jim, thank you, and Norman, and all your team. Give them a big hand, folks. <laughs> Jim, Jim, if I may, if you can, if you can come back up. Thank you. Thanks for your presentation, Mr. Chair. If I may. Thank Go you. Um, the um, <laughs> incredible program. 
in fact, a year ago this time, I was in the White House for a briefing um, at our Access DC, our annual Access DC um, trip. And the White House clearly respects and acknowledges Trade Connect here in our own backyard. So I acknowledge you, acknowledge the entire port uh, team for making this happen, and including our partners. My question is, how can we have, how are you reaching out to the Cheryls of the world that we just heard on the video? Wh what are you doing? What's your, um, I'm, I'm all big on measurables. Um, what's your uh, measure of effectiveness when you're reaching out to businesses like Cheryl's? Well, in order to keep our costs down, our, really what we do is partner with organizations such as chambers of commerce in each, for example, there's over 88 municipalities in LA County. So we go out to the local chambers and especially the economic development folks in those chambers and say, look, this is our program. We brief them on it. And then we try to use that as a platform. And we also reach out to ethnic chambers, whether it's the Asian business associations in each of the uh, districts and areas. They're very entrepreneurial, and they're always delighted to host us. So they proved an extremely good outreach. And of course, we work with different types of, it's like multi-dimensional uh, format, because we also reach out to, to, you know, to Port Tech has been a host for a couple of um, events. We also reach out to elected officials in some cases have mailing lists of manufacturers in their district. So we try to use every possible means of partnering. How many of these businesses have we've touched in Harbor City, Harbor Gateway, Wilmington, San Pedro? Well, again, we have a total aggregate. You know, we haven't been able to sort it by computer, by businesses, but we've had, I think, a, disp you know, a high proportion of our events in the three districts. Mm -hmm. uh, but we could find out specifically how many yeah, companies. If you can just get that to back out, I'd appreciate it. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're very welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, Madam Clerk, if I may, I apologize, but I want to do public comment right now. I have two cards, and I know some people may want to get on their horse because they just did public comment. So let me call on uh, Don Compton first, followed by Manny Silverteen. Is that right, Manny? Sergeant, can you give a little help right here just for... Thank you. Come to the right. Come to the right. Oh, okay. There we go. And I do uh, two-minute public comment, but if you need more, take it, okay? Uh, Donald, yes. Donald? Thank you. Uh, my name is Don Compton. I'm a legally blind jurist doctor. I'm the self-appointed public advocate for my hometown of Wilmington. And uh, after being retired as an educator, I have been working uh, diligently on my own to represent the working poor families of Wilmington. I have three jurist doctors, including myself. Um, who support this next issue that CD15 for the last 25 years has remained isolated from the rest of the city by not bringing light rail down here. It's supposed to be the Metro Gold South extension that's right on the MTA's master plan and has been for a dozen years. But the only way this thing can be delivered and funded is if someone from CD15 gets on that gets a mayoral appointment to that MTA board of directors. It hasn't happened in 25 years and it's deliberate. In fact, we three Juris Doctors, myself, Jenny Chavez, who's Mr. Buscaino's chief of staff, and Ms. Ms. Maddox, M-A-D-D-O-X, Capri Maddox, Assistant City Attorney, Special Advisor to Mr. Fuhrer himself, have all agreed that there is a probable, ongoing, equal protection of the law violation going on here because we haven't got the extension down here that all other areas in the City of Los Angeles with our population or larger have theirs. We're the only area in the entire city of Los Angeles without this direct connection, and Wilmington, the heart of the harbor, is most suitable for it. This has the full support of Ms. Allison Becker and the three Juris Doctors so named. Please work with His Honor the Mayor, he has four votes on the MTA Board of Directors, to get this thing addressed because the LA County Civil Grand Jury has already taken up my complaint and will come down with one decision or the other by June. Do we want them to handle this or can we? Thank you. Well, thank you for coming in and uh, reporting that. I support that and uh, Absolutely. and uh, and uh, be an advocate for it. Right. Uh, it's in addition to moving cargo, we need to move people in and out of this port. Exactly. Right. In addition, hey, Donald, with, uh, I got a question for you, Donald. 
It's a tough one. I'm a Silver Lake guy. You ever been to Silver Lake? Yes. Okay. But I'm also a lover of San Pedro, and I have great respect for Wilmington. Now, this is just a tough question. Now, I don't want to Anything put Anything at all. Go ahead. All right. I like uh, San Pedro a lot. Okay. Oh, here we go. But also, there's the Long Beach Freeway that goes to Long Beach. The Pasadena Freeway goes to Pasadena. Hollywood Freeway goes to Hollywood. Santa Monica Free goes to Santa Monica. I would like to come to your leadership in Wilmington and ask if we could begin this discussion to add San Pedro Freeway as opposed to the Harbor Freeway. Now, I see you giving me a cold response, so I... The, MT <laughs> the MTA's master plan calls for bringing the light go... I got that. I'm going to support you on that a thousand percent. Then, then but, please ask your question directly so I can answer it. All right. It. Can I change the name of the Harbor Freeway to the San Pedro Freeway without offending you with the approval of the state? Because I like where the freeway ends in San Pedro. Is this Mr. Labange? It is. Yeah. My frank, honest answer is okay. no. Okay, all right. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it, Mr. Because Compton. Because they're coming here to Wilmington uh, in the end because there is no sincere support in San Pedro to bring this light rail here. Otherwise, it had been here by since Joan Milky Flores urged it in 1988, and she was snubbed for it. Very good, Mr. There, Compton. Your public, thank you very much. I appreciate poll. that. That's okay. Poll, That's thank all right. We got it there. Okay, thank you. The next public speaker, Mr. Silverman, is that right? Silverstein? There's Mary. Mary, Mary, why did I say I, I need my glasses, Mary? Well, it's probably my handwriting. Well, I want to be blamed for it because right. I just got beat up by Don, and I don't want to take two people <laughs> beating me up down here. Don, have a good day. Well, you too, sir, and we want to get you here in half an hour next time so the traffic doesn't hold you up you by light rail. light rail. You got it, you're light rail. Oh. You got it. <laughs> Hi, uh, good afternoon and thanks for coming down. Um, so six years ago, the port and led, did I turn it off? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, six years ago, led by Janice Hahn, the port and 17 environmental groups entered into the TRAPAC MOU. And the TRAPAC MOU has a component in it that requires a report to this committee regarding a land use study. Uh, the land use study is supposed to be an off-port impact study, and it's focused on both Wilmington and San Pedro. And I'm here today to give a quick update on where we are with that study. I represent Harbor Community Benefit Foundation, and we're the local San Pedro nonprofit that oversees the Port Community Mitigation Trust Fund. And I'm happy to say we've had great relations with CD15 and with the port staff to work on numerous projects that are here in Pedro and Wilmington. We've actually put $2 million into the community in the last two years from all types of projects that we're working on. So the land use study was supposed to have been done by a contractor called Bay Area Council Institute. And the last report that we provided was back in 2012. And at that time, it was to say that the contract had been signed and we were moving forward with it. I'm here today to, s to give an update on that and to say, unfortunately, that contract didn't go very well and the uh, contractor was terminated after about nine months of work. So our board is now, um, and that's, uh, so the contractor terminated, settlement agreement was reached, and roughly one-third of the funds had been spent. So we now have about $195,000 still available in that fund, and we're about to go out with the new RFP and we'll be back before this committee to provide you an update when that RFP is ready. Thank you very much, Mary. Welcome. Thank Thanks, you. Mary. Okay. And now we're going to return to the next agenda item. Public comment has been completed. There's no other cards. And I see no one else for public comment. So we'll close public comment. Back to the agenda. Under item four, the Harbor Department is to report in response to requests from this committee that were made on November 19th, 2013, in connection with consideration of the Second Amendment to the port's permit with Trade PAC. Uh, that permit is for the design, construction, and operation of a marine container terminal at verse 136 to 147 uh, here at the port for a term of 30 years, ending in 2039. The Second Amendment, which was approved on count by council that same day, provided for changes in project scope to build an automated container terminal 
uh, instead of an expanded conventional terminal uh, as was originally envisioned. On November 19th, the Council adopted your committee's report and recommendations which included approval of the Second Amendment and which included requests that the Harbor Department report back in 90 days with specific procedural changes that will be made to rectify the issues raised in the reporting on the trade pack project to ensure that such issues do not reoccur. Also to report back on a, with a study on the impacts of automation, specifically on the impacts uh, on the port, its workforce, nearby communities, and a cost benefit analysis that takes into consideration the competitive challenges facing the port and uh, finally a plan for integrating a liaison between labor and the harbor department. Thank you very much. I have one public comment card before I call on staff. Tommy Fafay. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Council Labanj and uh, Buscano. Uh, my name is Tommy Favai. Uh, I represent IBEW, International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local Union 11, and I'm here to uh, fully support the Cherry Pack uh, Terminal Development Program to move forward. Uh, you know, it's a key when it comes to uh, the electrical grid infrastructure on uh, upgrading it, and uh, um, that can mean uh, you know good construction jobs, uh, especially now that trade pack is moving on on projects right now that uh, the projects are moving forward and 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 they're looking real good out there so um, I just uh, wholeheartedly support this project I'm moving forward thank you thanks Tommy thank hopefully, you hopefully skig is next okay uh, let's have a representative for the port I want to make a presentation good afternoon chairman Labange uh, council member Buscayano it's an honor to have you in our boardroom um, last November, we came, when we came before you and you approved the second amendment to the Trey Pack uh, permit, you asked us to come back and report on three specific items. So I'd like to spend a couple minutes, and I'll, I'll move through this quickly uh, in recognition of the time of day and, and, uh, and the fact that the record in front of you is pretty complete. So please stop me at any point if you have specific questions on any item. But I'd like to spend a couple minutes talking about the first report back that we, uh, we owe you. Uh, then I'm going to uh, turn it over to uh, Michael Keenan, who's going to talk a little bit about the automation study, and then I'll wrap up with the legislative liaison. So as you recall, um, we, uh, we were um, tasked with finding ways to um, ensure that what happened in the Trade Pack Development Program did not happen again. Now, when we came to you in November, we were in the midst of completing uh, an after action report. This happened following our board action, which also constituted a significant amount of information about what had uh, occurred in the Trade Pack Development Program. Uh, and then around the end of the year, when the after action report was complete, and this was a piece of information that was uh, provided in the packet you have in front of you, uh, it was performed by a member of the city family it was decided that we needed to have a complete outside set of eyes put on not only the information that we presented to our board in September, but also the significant body of information generated in the after action review. So we went through a process where we, um, we uh, approached uh, firms on our on-call list. We did a mini RFP and came up with a uh, firm by the name of Bronner. Bronner uh, has significant uh, experience dealing with public agencies that de deliver significant infrastructure. And so what I'm going to do is tell you a little bit about what the Bronner report found. This is a little graphic that's in their, that's in their report, and it's, uh, it's catchy in that it shows a container ship uh, with a bunch of boxes on Just it. Just excuse my back. I like the big screen. I don't like looking at the little screen, so if you don't mind. Not a problem. So you see a container crane with a ship and boxes. What Bronner did is they took what was on the left-hand side of the slide, which is what they call components of enterprise effectiveness. And this is a thing that they've learned over the years. Uh, enterprises, organizations really need to have if they're going to deliver effective capital programs. And since they have benchmarked so many organizations, we took, this, uh, we took serious uh, consideration of what they offered here. 
they found there were two areas that we need to work on, two broad areas that we need to work on in the Harbor Department. First is risk management, like you see at the top of the crane on the left, and the second is integration. And they fashioned six different recommended action items that came out of that. You see item one, the restructure, two, implement, three, uh, independent verification and validation, four, establishing roles, five, promoting a culture of risk uh, management, and then the last was integrating technology. So each one of these recommendations goes to the specific item, cause, or issue that was identified both in the AAR and in the Bronner Report. And you see on the left on this are the things that we, ha that we uh, found that needed to be dealt with increases in project cost estimate, the delay in the permit filing, uh, procedures on our leases, communication gaps, and so forth. So those are the things on the left that are, that are addressed with the recommendations you see on the right. Now one of the things that Bronner did is they assigned priorities because we know we're, we're biting off a pretty big chunk to make some fundamental changes in our enterprise. And so these are what we call three ship priorities. There's three is the highest priority. And the one thing that Bronner pointed to as the number one issue that we need to work on is what's called our Project Development Committee, or PDC. Now, PDC has been around the Harbor Department for a lot of years, for decades, in fact. And at certain points in the Harbor Department's um, uh, history, it's been a, a pretty effective at dealing with the issues at hand. However, as I'm sure, uh, council members, you've recognized in the items that have come before you, it's a different world out there now. The complexity, the cost, and the urgency of the projects in front of us are different. PDC needs to change. It needs to become more relevant. It needs to become less informal. One of the things that Bronner sh said is it's a too informal a group. It needs to be have its charter revised, and it needs to become much more structured. Mike, who appoints a committee? This is by the, the general manager. The GM establishes the committee. And who makes up the committee? Right now the committee is made up by the GM and the assistant GMs and the division heads. So all the key stakeholders internal are part of the PDC. I, I would just add, Councilman, is one of the things is uh, the ability to find and document decisions and in a repeatable method. Uh, that's one of the key things that I've seen is that in this committee, when you want to look back a year and a half ago for who made that decision, how was it made, that everything works through the committee, that uh, you know the general manager can't superside the, uh, supersede the committee. It really is, you know, institutionalized decision making and process thinking, and then of course uh, that feeds right into the board. Um, you know, working with Ambassador Martinez and and the board, um, making sure that any new project that comes up during the year and so forth, how is that communicated on forward in a very uh, institutionalized way? So it's not a person dependent, but it's institutionalized. And, and I think as Gary mentioned, we recognize that the board is the policy making body within the Harbor Department, so this all has to come to them. Getting, getting it right is important, and getting these lines of communication right is critical. And given the complexity and the costs and the speed with which things are developing here at the Harbor, this has, to, this has to become better. And we've already implemented a number of changes to PDC. Our PDC process is moving better than I think it has in a long time. But we will continue to make these reforms because this is the number one issue. Recommend, recommendation number two talks about transition to full accountability. Uh, I'd say on this moving from an old paradigm of project management structure to the new project accountability structure. We're about halfway there on this arc, this RQC. And one of the things that dovetails nicely with the PDC is that um, PDC involves all parts of the Harbor Department. And as, as organizations sometimes do, we've had a tendency to become a little bit too siloed. PDC brings together the development team on the infrastructure side, the business team on the deal side, and the financial team on the, on the financial accountability side, the executive team, and then loops back to the board. So it crosses over, and our project management structure is needing to emulate the same thing. We've already made changes. For instance, a project manager on a critical project that maybe didn't get invited to meetings 
with the real estate group that are having tenant negotiations is now part of those meetings so that the negotiating team knows exactly what the infrastructure implications of negotiating points are. The infrastructure team uh, project manager knows where the business deal is headed. So that's already about halfway there, but that's the second uh, critical item that Bronner pointed out. Into the two ship side of the recommendations, number three is independent verification uh, and validation. This is the kind of a process where you have another set of eyes on what the development team has done in terms of an estimate. Uh, we put tremendous effort into making the estimate for the TRAPAC projects, but we were wrong. And one of the ways we're going to deal with this is put more eyes on it and more independent eyes on it. Sure. This, this becomes particularly important as we get into these technology delivering programs where we're doing some things we've honestly never done before. Explain independent. How independent? Someone who did not have a, a role in, a, in generating the original estimate, uh -huh. who did not do the design, who didn't really have a stake in it to begin with. So there's no reason for someone, uh, for anyone to say, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to gloss over that one. Right. Somebody completely uh, un... But uh, the board will be aware of that, right? They'll report to the board or the general manager or whom? The, they will report to the board through the PDC process okay, good. Super. because these independent verifications will bubble through the PDC and then come up to the board through committee or directly to the board. I, explain the technology on, on TRAPAC. How, how is the, um, the infrastructure that's being built today different than, say, Middle Harbor across the way? Uh, interestingly, it's not very different from Middle Harbor, but when we put the, the TRAPAC estimate together, we went and grabbed the uh, consultant who had done the only other one ever built in the U.S. in Norfolk. Mm -hmm. uh, we tasked them with doing this work and we thought, well, we've got people that have done it. They should, they, we put a lot of trust in it. I, it was my understanding that the reason, the, one of the reasons for the overage is, was because of the, the new technology that's being built at TRAPAC. And that is true, Councilman. Uh, in not, the time between- Very similar to the Middle Harbor in Long Beach. It's very similar because what we found is the technology that was employed in Norfolk was um, a generation or so behind the technology that's being applied, uh, applied at TRAPAC. The technology has moved so fast. Now, Middle Harbor has been moving fast also. Mm -hmm. But the other thing that's happening is the some of the technology at Middle Harbor is different even on the same timeline also, as ours. Also. For instance, uh, TRAPAC is using automated shuttle carriers. Uh, and a certain type of key crane or wharf crane to drop the box and then carry it into the, into the uh, stacks. Uh, Middle Harbor is using automated shuttle carriers, a different vehicle that has different kind of control systems. Yeah. They have a different kind of crane. They're doing a, du a dual hoist crane that has an automated second stage. So all of these things force slightly different infrastructure and considerations on the, uh, on the uh, technology. So it's the movement of cargo that differs between Traypack and Middle Harbor. Uh, from the wharf into the from stacks, the wharf into the largely, tank. yes. On, on the same point, TRAPAC has a very advanced rail yard uh, that has automatable cranes on it. Uh, so it's different in that regard. One of the things we've learned in benchmarking these automated terminals, I think, uh, is that uh, while the, the basic features are similar, the details are different. And if I were to say that one of the lessons learned in TRAPAC is the details will kill you if you don't really understand exactly what's going on. Sure. And that's a lesson we're taking very much to heart in the development of, of any other automated terminals at the port. Uh, recommendation four is another two ship, and that's, um, as you see these bubbles coming together, we need, we've decided we need to give our financial and audit group a little bit more active role in this as an oversight, as, an, as a resource, as an ability to help us as we move through these very expensive projects. We've already started a lot of this interaction, particularly on the long-term projections. And I think, uh, Council Member, we've shared that a little bit with your staff. And one of the things we've, we've done is reached out to start having more regular meetings with your staff and actually cut you in on some of what we're doing here so you can see some of these long-term projections. This is a, is a, uh, is a logo, that, or is a, a graphic that I kind of like because it's descriptive. You know, as a propeller, uh, if we don't do a better job, as I believe we are starting to now on risk management, we'll be diced up by this propeller because risk is a huge part of what we deal with now. 
especially as these projects get more complicated and expensive. So promoting this culture of risk management is already started. Uh, we've already made modifications in some of our lease agreements that share the risk with the customers so that if things change, it's automatically wired into the lease agreement that they get a financial share of that change. And then the last one is a one-ship issue, and this is enterprise issue uh, software getting our enterprise uh, research program and the accounting software and the engineering software to talk to each other so we have some effective tools. So the four things that lie ahead of us are to, again, review these with you. We've reviewed those with these with our commission last week and have got their thumbs up. Uh, once it clears uh, this committee, we'll establish a seat on a better, uh, better government um, implementation uh, steering committee uh, to watch over our progress on these issues, assign accountability, and establish a monitoring framework. And we'd be glad to come back and tell you about it at any point. But uh, we have already started moving forward on these, and we will continue to do so. So before, Council, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Before we uh, move over to the, uh, uh, the second report back on automation, uh, we thought it would be good for you to see what tray pack automation is going to look like. So if I could have you uh, click on this and, and run this. This is an animation starting from the ship, going to the shore using these uh, automated shuttle carriers. Again, there is an actual person on this wharf crane. From here on out, it's automated. These automated shuttle carriers will take the containers uh, so to... So you, you have someone, in a remote control, I'm thinking like in a remote control car, right? No, these are fully automated. automated. But, but the, it's operated at a central control point. Uh, these ASCs can be remote operated, but in the mode they are right now, they're fully automated. Then the stack crane, the automatic stacking crane is fully automated. You see the truck driver will come into the slot and you see that the driver has to get out of the truck and go to that little red booth, stands on a pressure plate. The computer will not let that box go onto the truck until that driver is in that box. That's one of the basic tenets of automation. You can't mix people and machines in the same space. Automated machines, I should say. And then once it's on the truck, he takes off. Mike, yes or no, will this improve the efficiencies in the Port of Los Angeles? Will automation overall improve the efficiencies at the Port of Los Angeles? Short answer is yes. Okay. So with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Michael Keenan, who is our Assistant Director of Planning. He's acting as the Director of Planning. He's also our Chief Economist. And uh, he's going to tell you a bit about a, a rather extensive amount of work he's done on the uh, Container Terminal Automation Report. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Good afternoon. We were asked to provide a report to the uh, the City Council on a, st a study of the impacts of container automation, uh, including container terminal automation, including impacts in the port, the workforce, and the community, and a cost benefit analysis that takes into consideration the competitive challenges that the port faces. Yes, thank you. Uh, some of the limitations of doing a study like this are that uh, information on the cost structures, the business models, and the long-term business plans of terminals is not always readily available. Um, and as Mr. Christensen pointed out in great detail, there, there's not one thing that's automation. It's a variety of different technologies that can be employed, um, both on the, on the crane side and on the backland side. And so there's no single universe to compare against. Um, the impacts are also going to be determined based on the interplay between labor um, and the terminal operators as well, in terms of staffing levels, contractual arrangements, um, and um, workforce retraining as well. Um, and finally, the competitive environment, it's a dynamic one and not a static one. So it needs to take into, take into account our competitive positions uh, and the impacts of, potential of cargo growth over time as well. Uh, preliminary results include not preliminary because I'm done, but uh, uh, on the labor and the workforce impacts, um, automation will lead to a reduction in the amount of ILW labor that's required. But the amount of reduction across the port is going to depend on what types of technologies are employed, um, which is, is something that it can be, will be worked out over time um, between terminal operators and, and, the lab and labor. 
and the amount of reduction can be offset by new jobs in repair and maintenance um, of the automated equipment. And the ultimate impact is going to depend on the ultimate choice of staffing levels and the amount of workforce retraining that is effectively employed. Automation can improve the efficiency of the cargo handling and the speed and the velocity of cargo, which is especially important as first volumes increase and the second as larger ships arrive uh, because the amount of time it takes and the amount of operating capability you have to handle a 12,000 TU ship is actually very different than handling two 6,000 TU ships. And automation as a technology can certainly help with that, handling these super post Panamax vessels. So anywhere in the country, are we seeing this type of technology other than Long Beach and LA? Uh, the Norfolk um, is the uh, is the model right now, um, but as as Mr. Kinsen said, it's an older technology. Um, New York, New Jersey has a terminal. Of this of this size. Of this size, I'm not I'm not sure how big the Bayonne terminal is going to be at New York, New Jersey, but they have a similar automated stacking crane system they're putting in. It may be a little bit smaller because they actually have to put their cranes in diagonally on, versus the wharf as opposed to either a parallel or perpendicular structure, which you'd see um, here in Trey Pack or Middle Harbor. I see. <laughs> so, uh, as for terminal operating costs, terminal operating costs are likely to go down under automation. Um, the amount of labor reduction uh, depends on, the amount of cost reduction is going to depend on labor cost savings versus the cost of capital employed. So again, it's going to depend on each terminal specific uh, characteristics. Um, and because it's going to vary from terminal to terminal, um, it's not possible for us to determine on a port-wide basis what it's going to look like in the future, because there's a lot that remains to be seen depending on what choices are made by both labor and terminal operators going forward. As for our competitive impact, um, automation, if it reduces terminal costs and, oper and increases operating efficiencies, uh, can provide a competitive advantage to a terminal that employs it, um, or a port that has terminals that have automation. Conversely, if other ports are, have automated terminals, uh, that can give them a competitive advantage over the Port of Los Angeles. Um, the amount of cargo at risk depends on, again, those differences between the cost structures at, at different ports. Okay, we're, we're in two years that I've been here, it seems like we're competing more with Long Beach than any other port in the country. So how, and the Ambassador, and you've heard of this as well, how is, okay, so the port tenants, I mean, do we, at TRAPAC we have folks solidified there, our lease agreement with our tenants or our customers are how, how long there? The lease term, there? term on TRAPAC, it should be um, 20 years, I believe. Yeah, I think it's at 20 right now. And what's the situation at Middle Harbor and Long Beach? Uh, that was a 30-year, I believe. 30-year lease with OCL? Was it extended to 40? I think it may have gone even longer. It is a shipping line. Mm -hmm. And they're at 40 years there. I'm not sure. I think it probably is 40, yes. So it's a longer ter term there. Okay. Go ahead. Um, we took a preliminary look at the impacts on one container terminal, looking at the impacts on TRAPAC. Um, and the tra automation at TRAPAC is likely to result in um, about a 40, 50, 40 to 50% reduction in labor needed um, because of the impacts of both the Autostrad um, carriers that moving boxes from the cranes uh, to the, the back line. And that's been a concern here, my colleagues and I. What's a terminal operator doing to address that 40 percent reduction in, in the workforce? Well, about a quarter of that has already been offset by the increase in the number of mechanics that have been employed. So that actually reduces the amount that you would potentially see under that. Um, also another offset is if that, if that attracts more volume to the Port of Los Angeles because of cost advantages over competing ports, um, then, then cargo growth can offset that. Um, looking at the, the port complex as a whole, um, if the port continues to grow at anything over 2% a year, um, the, the, the additional jobs that you would get from um, the growth in volume would result in more longshore jobs then, then you would lose to any kind of offset it to, uh, to automation. And 
Talk to me about internationally. Is, is this a case for ports around the world that are automated? Um, yes, um, ports around the world that have automated have automated for for different reasons. Obviously, it depends on the companies, uh, the particular characteristics, and the labor relationships. Uh, but my back of the envelope answer is that um, European ports tended to automate because of high labor costs, and so the cost savings from automation drove that. Um, whereas in Asia, it's more often the high cost of land that g drives you to densify, have much more dense uh, terminal operation there, as opposed to the labor costs. Um, so um, we here in the United States, and especially with the fantastic port complex like L.A. Long Beach, um, have been this middle ground where we have um, reasonable labor costs and quite a bit of uh, land that has allowed us to operate on non-automated uh, terminals so far. And that is something that will change as we start handling more cargo going forward. And so either automation or other efficiency technologies, often in partnership with labor, um, will be necessary. You know, this issue came up uh, at my house yesterday during Easter celebration. <laughs> it was about, I think I had five longshoremen um, that we celebrated Easter together. And everyone's talking about trade pack down at the docks and how much of an impact it's going to have on their jobs. Um, Hussein, you're looking at a 40% reduction. And we, we know automation is coming. My family at the docks know it's coming. We just need to be sure we train the re retrain the workforce and have them ready for it. But you're telling me that the terminal operator uh, has a third of the 40% 40 per 40 reduction or training in, in the mechanics? About a, about a quarter of About that. a quarter. Yes. And, then, and the others? Um, well, I mean, it's not, it's not in operation right now. And um, there's currently discussions going on uh, between labor and management, both at the TRAPEC level and um, labor agreement coastwide as well in terms of what is the what's the appropriate boundary for what work is within ILW jurisdiction uh, versus um, other unions or or, or non-union workforces okay. uh, and so there's a, still quite a bit of uncertainty about how that's going to be resolved but there actually could be quite a bit more work um, that can fall into ILW jurisdiction so uh, increasing the amount of uh, potential jobs that workforce retraining um, can be helpful for very good Bobby Oliveira. The new president of ILW 13 making his first appearance in front of TCT. Welcome. Good morning, Councilman. Good morning, uh, crowd. So, well, the first time here, and I'm going to uh, have to dispute pretty much everything that was just said. Um, you know, first of all, we look at... Uh, the labor costs when we talk about retraining the workforce there's not a single longshoreman to date that's been taken out of a position where his job is going to be lost due to automation that's being retrained not a single one we have 6800 members not a single person is even enrolled in a program uh, the, the facility's already started I and mean, we were out there the last two weeks and when you talk about efficiency you talk about getting the trucks out of the queue lines getting them into the facilities, getting their cans loaded, and getting them out the gate. Anybody that went out and saw this operation will know it's not efficient. It's slow. It's arduous. You only have to look at Virginia, where APM terminals gave up the lease because it was not a financially uh, beneficial process for them. You only have to look to Australia, where they've had the same auto strads for nine years. We just sent a delegation there. They told us it's still not working. They're still trying to get the bugs out of it. So really what we're looking at is taxpayer dollars, port dollars, that are going to provide benefits to companies but not to the community. There's been no transparency. Uh, we worked over four years ago to try to get the schematics and the repair manuals for the equipment that is going to be brought onto the facility so that our workers could be prepared, so that when the equipment did arrive, that we'd have the workers on the dock to say, we're here, we're ready to fix the equipment. And uh, we were blocked by that, by the port's tenant. You know, we talk about new jobs, we talk about losing 40% of, of the workforce. Um, the facility is working right now. We've had two ships in where they brought off cargo. They can call it testing, but when you bring off cargo off of a ship, that's revenue generating, that's working a vessel. And you still have foreigners, and you still have people from outside of this community wandering the docks, doing work that is traditional longshore work. And we look at the equipment, and we talk about splitting a baby, so to speak, about whose work it's going to be. I think traditionally, 
the ILWU and this harbor community is recognized at the Port of Los Angeles and the Port of, Los San uh, Port of Long Beach, uh, that's where longshoremen work. We don't build skyscrapers in downtown LA. We don't repair elevators in Simi Valley. We're longshoremen. And the waterfront is, I dare to say this, but property of the ILWU. We've been here for 75 years. We're not going anywhere. And I think there needs to be some transparency when money's put forth to these companies, that when automation comes, that there's some dialogue, not roadblocks, not you'll get it when you see it, because all that leads to is continually fighting. Every time a ship comes in now, we'll be out there fighting for our jobs, putting things in front of the arbitrator, but more than anything, making sure that the dollars that were spent and are continuing to be spent on this project are not going for naught. We can't cry over what's happened, and, and again, we're going to look forward to, to what can be done in the future, but I think this is a big lesson. Automation hasn't worked in a large part of the, uh, the world. You know, these, this equipment is not going to make the port more efficient. The port's going to be more efficient when the port tenants and labor get together and come up with real life ideas, real world ideas. Part of it is three o'clock gates. Part of it is opening up these facilities from three in the morning to eight in the morning when traffic is at a bare minimum on the highways, manning the facilities so that these truck drivers can come in. We all know what the freeways look like between 8.30 and three in the afternoon and four in the afternoon. They're packed. People are trying to get home. If we had light rail, they could probably get home a little easier. But they're trying to get home. We need the gates opened up middle of the night. A, a, a modern terminal, the world port, and we shut down because of costs. And we're talking about you got to spend money to make money. Our guys are here at the dispatch hall. Our workers are here ready to go to work from 3 to 8 in the morning, and the gates continually remain closed. And that's something that's got to change. There's got to be some transparency between these companies, the workforce, obviously the port and the city. We're all in this together. But what I don't think the community is here for, and I think there's going to come a reckoning, a day of reckoning, where the community is going to stand up and say, all of this money was spent for what? To maximize profits for corporations that's going to leave this community. And I don't think that's what we want. I don't think we want to be standing in, on bread lines or having less of an Easter because we're losing 40% of our work. That's not good for the community. It's not good for the port. So I would ask that uh, the two council members that are here and the port staff to readdress both the lines of communication between TRAPAC, the ILW, and the port to become more transparent in what's happening and to assist the ILW in demanding from TRAPAC that they provide the cross-training, that they put their money where their mouth is. We haven't had a single person retrained. Not a third, not a quarter, not a single individual has been retrained. Not a single individual is enrolled in retraining. And I think it's a shame that we sit here today and uh, make statements that are going to go on the record that are clearly not true. And I would ask you guys to address those and please get back to us. And I'm available to both the city council members and the port staff at your will. Thank you very much. Howdy. No other comment on that, on the report? I think you should uh, take those concepts too. I know one of the issues of labor is so key and working together. And is there a uh, assistant port director of labor relations here? Um, council member, we're in the process of selecting we're, that person. Yeah, I think that's right, real that key. And uh, take their jacket off and uh, roll up their sleeves and, and find a way to bring everybody together and find common good. I do believe it's the property of the people of Los Angeles. But I know if uh, I had trouble with Mr. Compton, I think I would have trouble with, I, uh, with your union if we uh, met on the street. So I won't. You don't understand what I'm saying. I'm saying that lightly. So this was important. Yeah, okay. your voices. In, in the selection of the labor liaison, it's important to have uh, an individual who has um, background in the labor front. Um, so I, I, I know that's going to be part of this report to direct the commission to swiftly, in light of the ongoing negotiations uh, in the Bay Area, to swiftly make that selection of the labor liaison uh, to the Port of Los Angeles. And then lastly, my question, Mr. Chair, if I may, the overage of the cost set, the over cost overruns at TRAPAC, how um, are the cost overruns going to impact other critical infrastructure improvement projects like our LA waterfront um, here at the port? Well, our board has, uh, Gary Moore, interim executive director, our board has asked us to uh, come uh, come back to them. We're, we're scheduled, uh, hopefully, uh, May 1st to go back to them to talk about s uh, uh, preparing an amendment to TRAPAC to review the uh, additional costs that were impact uh, uh, that 
that resulted in the automation. So we're still reviewing uh, which projects have, uh, will be impacted uh, as the, of this uh, cost impact. And just please be sure to get that mm -hmm. to this committee. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Communication is the biggest skill on any kind of relationship, so that's the key. And having the city's interest, when the city should also have the interest of all, so that's how it should fall under. Next. So uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Oh, uh, so it looks sure. like we're going to note and file A and B, and then sure. on C we're going to direct. <laughs> I'm taking your taking your line. We're going to direct the port to uh, identify a labor liaison right. uh, position. That's on 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 C, right? Um, yes. If you if that's what you want the right. recommendation. Okay with that? Yeah. That's okay. okay. Got it. So it would be to um, note and file the, um, the report from the Harbor Department and also to direct the port for, um, to include a labor liaison. Correct. In fact, if I may, Mr. Chair, um, I think we should hold, in hearing the concerns from ILW, I believe we, let's hold the, um, the item that is at A. Um, I'm sorry, item B. Let's hold item B. Um, unless you want to address uh, Mr. Uh, Olvera's um, concerns about no, I think the lack of transparency, or if we hold B so I we can bring people to the table to continue to address their concerns. I'm, I'm actually, uh, tomorrow, Mr. Christians and myself have scheduled a meeting to go visit Mr. Olvera. Uh, uh, at 10 30 tomorrow so i think it's always healthy we also need the the tenant let's have trey pack represented there as well we'll we'll, uh, we'll definitely follow through on on your request okay, let's report why back. do we do this why do we Thanks. do well, well, why do we do this why do we if you're prepared to make action uh the only thing i would put the brakes on is if when we get to council if you're not prepared i'd hold it over until you're prepared you prepared you could we could go forward because uh, i uh, trusted you gary leemore I don't know, do we need council action on this? This goes to council, right? We don't, there's, we don't believe there's any council action. Okay, but I would like to note and I'd like to yes. tell our colleagues what you guys are doing. Well, so. What we have before us right now is a report from the Harbor Department and it's more of an informational report rather Good. than um, one with recommendations. There's no recommendations within this. With that being said, why don't we, uh, well, let's hear it again in committee, okay? But uh, move forward yep. on that. Have the city's interest, the port's interest, but that also includes all the people, including those who represent it. Okay, thank you. So that will be to continue this item. Okay, we'll hear it again. It may be uptown, but it will hear it again. Okay, up the San Pedro Freeway. Thank okay. you so much thank for that you. report. Thank you. All right, next item. Yes, under item five, motion Buscaino Labange introduced on July 24th, 2012, proposes that the council ask the Harbor Department to report to this committee with regular monthly status updates on the progress made on all efforts related to the San Pedro waterfront project, such as crafted at the port, the downtown harbor, ports of call redevelopment, city dock one, plaza park, among others. Thank you, I have one public comment card, Mr. Ken Melendez. And Mr. Melendez, I apologize, uh, you had six too. So uh, we already acted on six. So if you need, to, yeah, we did, correct? Yeah. We no, we haven't six? done six yet. So we'll do you now. Okay, you don't have to get out of here. You're okay, you can do five and then come back for six? Yes. Thank you, five, please go ahead. Okay, um, I gave both of you a packet here. First time I ever heard the term in institutional racism, 1969, Delano, California. I took that picture when I was 15 years old. Wow. Next picture is me picketing in front of a store when I was 14 in the San Fernando Valley. The next item is I'm asking some questions. What is institutional racism? What are, what are cumulative impacts and environmental justice? The next item is the demographical profile of the community of Wilmington. The next item is the community and port plans under Mayor Hahn. You can see it speaks for itself. It needs to be updated by me. After that, in 2003, Every place you see me asking a question, that's me asking a question. That's the port staff does as they, as they are, the mayor sets the policy of, of uh, institutional racism. That's the actual policy being carried out. 
The next item is the Wilmington Neighborhood Assessment done by the ARB, I believe. You can see where the impacts are. The next item is Environmental Justice Policy, California State Lands Commission. The port is owned by the people of the state of California, all of us. It's not owned by foreign companies. It's not owned by anybody else. It's owned by all the people of the state of California. Next item is this project right here. It's a completed EIR for the Wilmington waterfront. The next item, you can read that it says right in there that the community agreed to leave uh, broad open to Banning's Landing. And the next item is an instrument of institute. Yeah, I did. Thanks, Joe. The next item is the, is the policy of institutional racism being carried out against the, the Wilmington community under Mayor Eric Garcetti. What it does, it, it closes Freeze and Avalon to Banning's Landing, and no bicycle will be able to get there, no uh, and, uh, walking will get there, even though in this thing it's to connect the two communities. It's to connect the, the people with, with the water area, which isn't much. Um, we have a, they have an overpass they're building in the tray pack. Once again, the people in Wilmington are going to have to go a mile out of the way to get down to their thing, which for 150 years, this is where Banning started the port. This is where that Avalon's been open for 150 years. Everyone in Wilmington knows where Avalon is and how you, how you get to the, the waterfront. So that's my comment. What we're asking for in Wilmington is fair share. And then I'll have a comment on six. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right, we have staff, please. Good afternoon, Council Members. Dave Mathewson, Interim Deputy Executive Director for the Port. Uh, I'd like to share with you uh, an overview of our waterfront project and status. Um, before I begin, I would like to mention that um, we consider the LA waterfront both San Pedro and Wilmington. Uh, and as you may recall, in 2009, we had both the Wilmington waterfront EIR as well as the San Pedro waterfront EIR approved by our board. Uh, and I know the purpose of this motion is relating to the San Pedro, and I'd like to spend some time going through the San Pedro waterfront uh, projects and the current status. <clears throat> so basically, the uh, San Pedro waterfront project that was approved by the board in 2009 uh, covers approximately 600 acres. Uh, and the purpose here, the intent was to make it more of a visitor-serving destination, try to what we called at the time to deindustrialize the waterfront, make this more of a, a, uh, uh, a visitor-serving destination along the waterfront, provide a greater uh, transition between the core cargo handling activities of the port on Terminal Island to the downtown San Pedro area. So we wanted to have a transitional use there. Uh, and so the focus was on providing for uh, visitors serving in open space destinations. So going from the uh, uh, north to the south, um, we have, um, no, this doesn't seem to pick it up. Uh, I apologize, this is not trying. <laughs> Lazy laser. <laughs> um, Yeah, there we go. So um, what we've done to date, uh, we have done certain elements of the water overall waterfront project. The waterfront project included a number of elements, uh, some of which have already been completed, and I'd like to go through those. The first one is the um, uh, completion of the uh, cruise terminal promenade uh, around the cruise terminal, around the slip, and that actually goes all the way down to the downtown harbor. Um, the idea, one of the elements of the waterfront was to have a continuous water's edge promenade. And so we've got this element already completed. Uh, we have completed the elements in the Cabrillo Way Marina, uh, as well as around the existing um, Cabrillo Marina Phase 1 project. So we have a fairly large portion of the, of the promenade complete. Uh, moving south, we had a number of uh, proposed uh, water cuts the North Harbor uh, Basin, uh, and then the Downtown Harbor, and then the 7th Street Pier. Uh, currently, um, 
The downtown harbor project is, uh, un has been underway. It's going to be completed shortly. It will host, uh, be vital in hosting the tall ships uh, later this summer. Uh, this is an acre and a half of additional new fill, uh, new open water area. The idea here is to uh, allow for the water, bring that water's edge closer to downtown and provide a stronger connectivity to downtown San Pedro. Um, with the North Harbor cut uh, that was proposed, uh, that is now the location of the USS Iowa. So that that harbor cut is not contemplated at this time. We have the. Um, was, I would say it's probably. Sorry. Question was, <laughs> I get excited about this. How much money did the port save by placing the Iowa where it's at today, by not going into the cut? Uh, not, perf not doing the North Harbor cut that's probably um, in the neighborhood for that project alone is in the neighborhood of uh, probably north of $10 million. Uh, Let the record reflect that the port saved north of $10 million by placing the Iowa there. And then we also, uh, just to cl uh, complete that thought, uh, council member, we did lose the third cruise berth there. Uh, and so now we presently have to, when we have third cru uh, three cruise ships, we have to um, uh, berth them out here. But no permanent structure there. No permanent structure at this time. We have to uh, use uh, temporary facilities. Then uh, moving south, uh, we, have the uh, we have the proposed ports of call redevelopment. And uh, actually, if I could, I'd like to wait and come back to that uh, afterwards. Uh, south of the, uh, s of the uh, Ports of Call area, we have City Dock 1. Uh, this used to be a former liquid bulk petroleum storage facility uh, that closed in 2009. Uh, a couple of years ago, we did uh, complete the demo. Actually, I believe it was last year we completed the removal of the tanks. This site still needs to be remediated, uh, and this would be the site for the proposed Alta C uh, project that was approved by the City Council in December of last year. Um, in the Outer Harbor, we have a number of open space projects. The uh, 22nd Street Park was completed. Uh, that is an 18-acre park that cost uh, $21 million to construct. It's been heavily used uh, for, for uh, passive uh, recreational uses. Now, I understand, and Gary Lee Moore and I have a meeting uh, right after this. There have been minimum use there, though, as far as major events and outdoor concerts. Can you give, just because the members of the public here, I see our fine president of the count neighborhood council, Dave Behar, um, folks like him have been asking, why aren't we having huge musical festivals there at the 22nd Street Park? I, I think there's two reasons, uh, council members. One is the, um, the turf. We wanted to make sure that the turf wasn't, w it was designed so that it couldn't support large-scale stages and events on there, so it would be significant damage to the turf. Secondly, uh, well, I, I mean, think... Poor planning. Well, I mean, it's such a great open space, and we're just using it for passive purposes, which is fine, but... But, but I just think... Just a tip from an older councilman. Sorry. When Sorry, you have just music just events, you then get a Monday morning noise complaint event. So that's my only thing i got to say. We have a great neighborhood council system down here <laughs> that we embrace, <laughs> that we would include in the planning. <laughs> and, and that was the second reason, as, as Councilmember LeBange had mentioned. We had concerns about um, negative well, the externalities. Maybe, the PCAC then? There was PCAC. Uh, I believe Crescent Avenue uh, Homeowners Association expressed some concerns about uh, the immediate proximity of such events impacting their their uh, residences okay. and their activities. So that was why, because of those concerns, that we didn't provide for a development that would allow for um, more active use of the site. And in place of that, what we decided to do was to move those types of activities, which we agree they're critical to programming the waterfront. We decided to use that in the uh, in the outer harbor site on an interim basis. Uh, until uh, the potential need for additional cruise terminals are developed. So, uh, as you are well aware, Council Member, we've had Cirque du Soleil out there. We're Great use of that, absolutely. And we'll have the Global Exciting. Rally Cross out there uh, yes. later this summer. So, we think that's a, a, a great location to put on those types of events. Fantastic. 
Uh, and then we've completed the Cabrillo Way Marina project. That was uh, 700 slips um, redeveloped uh, in Watchorn Basin. Um, and uh, that completes the, uh, the southerly section. So what I'd like to do now is go back to uh, Ports of Call uh, and provide a status report on where we're at with Ports of Call. Uh, Ports of Call, as you, re re as you oh, um, okay, we'll go on to the Wilmington projects. Oh, one last thing, uh, as also as part of a, a project for the San Pedro waterfront, a project element was the adaptive reuse of the old warehouses at 9 and 10 in the Outer Harbor. And uh, we went through that through a competitive solicitation, crafted at the Port of Los Angeles, opened their doors a little over a year ago. Uh, in using Warehouse 10, they have over 100 uh, artists now selling crafts. Um, Warehouse 9 is now being uh, proposed to be developed uh, to support restaurants and a craft brewery. So we're hoping that um, those uh, 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 subleases would be uh, completed this summer and they can start construction. I just about to ask the timeline on that, Dave. So yeah. Uh, right now, we just spoke to Crafted last week. Um, they're uh, well on the way to f securing the necessary financing to proceed with this. So um, we think that, or they, they think that uh, they're optimistic that by the end of the summer they could have the financing in place. It, it was promised, um, or not promised, it was, we, 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 I, I heard that it'd be ready by the summer, so that's not the case. Yeah, that won't the brewery happen. will be open by the summer, but that's not yeah, the case. Yeah, that's not going to happen, because they'll, they'll, we'll, we'll need to, uh, they'll obviously need to go through city and get all the necessary permits, and, and they're just not there with the, with the financing package. And the state. I just had a question I wanted to ask. Uh, this is the project that Mr. Rakovich is the... That supports a uh, call. Yeah. yeah he gonna, has great uh, history in transforming Los Angeles, so I think it's so exciting to have him down there. I would just say I want to make one thing for the port and uh, the ambassadors here as well, or the president of the commission. Sometimes if you go somewhere to see something, you have a full understanding. I remember when Pier 39 was nothing in the Bay Area, and then they made it Pier 39 something, and it's a dynamic economic engine, not just the old Fisherman's Wharf, but all the way down to the uh, Oakland Bay Bridge. If it's possible, with the select leadership, and you have a great neighborhood council, uh, both in Wilmington and San Pedro and other areas, some of those community leaders go up on an early flight and home on a, a late flight and tour 39 with the planning people of the Port of San Francisco and some of the city officials up there just to see the dynamic. It's, it's uh, as Mr. Buscaino said, I know he's a champion for this. It's a, it's a, it's a diamond in the, in the rough, really. And I remember as a child coming down here and going and going over the ferry building. You weren't even born then, Joe. And it was a big trip for a big family to go down and see the port and watch it work. And I think there's a whole new way because more people are involved in staycations. More people are staying in town and exploring Los Angeles and want to see real. So there's a great opportunity. But I just wanted to put out if there's a way uh, with the, the select group that you could maybe see what they're doing in San Francisco or go to San Diego by bus one day just to see what they're doing and transforming the gas lamp district in San Diego and the convention, there's opportunity there. And I always think it's important to take the community leadership with you uh, so they could see firsthand with your planners. Just an idea. Mm -hmm. But if you could give us a wrap up on this, because we could go, Gary? We just want to hit a couple of the Wilmington projects and then we'll uh, wrap it up uh, with the ports of call. Uh, really, uh, two major elements in regards to the Wilmington waterfront. Uh, obviously, the uh, Wilmington waterfront park, the 30 acre site, was, uh, has been uh, completed and has been a huge success. It's amazing. So many people are using that park. Amazing. It, it is absolutely amazing. It's a, it's a great asset to the community. And then the other element, and this is some of the, uh, some of the uh, photos of the, of the park. Uh, the aerial view of, of the park as well. Um, and then, um, let me go back, and then the second major project uh, that we are... Uh, Want to hit on the Wilmington Marina? Oh, the uh, parkway? We just, we just, yeah, the parkway. Wilmington Parkway, open, yeah. yeah. Uh, we just op had a grand opening of the Wilmington Parkway, uh, and and um, actually that's just off of this slide. It's... it's um, up in this area right here, it was about a um, one and a half million dollar 
uh, project that was just uh, recently opened by the council member and the community, uh, and that provides for um, uh, landscaped uh, walkways, uh, additional sidewalks, lighting, um, and that uh, appears to be being utilized by the folks in that immediate area as well. And then finally, the, the larger pr uh, waterfront project that was part of the uh, 2009 approval by the board in the EIR was to provide this linkage from the Wilmington Waterfront Park uh, along Avalon Boulevard Corridor to bring it to the water down to Banning's Landing, which is right here. Uh, and this project involved uh, the development of a land bridge because of the active rail lines through here uh, and Water Street. We wanted to realign Water Street, have a, um, a land bridge with landscaped areas, a pedestrian bridge that will link to it into an iconic uh, tower display right at the, uh, right at the foot of the uh, Avalon Boulevard, uh, which would provide a, uh, an overview of port operations. There would also be some limited commercial development here, about 10,000 square feet to support restaurants and some uh, retail operations. But this would be a plaza area, uh, a promenade that would connect to the uh, Banning's Landing and then up Avalon Boulevard back into the Wilmington community and the Wilmington Park, uh, Waterfront Park. And then quickly back to um, Ports of Call. Um, uh, this is the ports. This is the site. As you may recall, um, the port went out with a competitive solicitation back in July of 2012 uh, to secure a uh, or, or select a, a, a commercial developer. Uh, we went through that, and we ended up select, selecting a development team of uh, Wayne Ratkovich and uh, Jericho Development, which is a local San Pedro development team. Um, we entered into a uh, exclusive negotiating agreement with this development team. Uh, and there were responsibilities on both sides in terms of due diligence. Uh, this development team has uh, continues to work on their development concept, uh, but it does um, include uh, visitors serving retail, restaurants, and a, a significant anchor tenant um, uh, for the project. Uh, right now, uh, while I think um, we probably all agree that the process is been a little bit slower than we l would have liked. Uh, there is a there is a, a huge amount of due diligence that's been required on both sides, um, and so we continue to um, to work towards uh, the ultimate goal of getting a term sheet and a ground lease uh, approved uh, by the board and ultimately the city council. Um, the t uh, yeah, the term sheet, the ground lease would uh, uh, we would need the environmental to support. Uh, those actions. So we, we need to determine ultimately what the scope of this development is going to be so then we can assess it environmentally. Does, uh, does this Ports of Call redevelopment include the uh, historic San Pedro City Hall or some connection it's to it? Outside. It's outside. Just by a foot? <laughs> it's across the street. Cool. And uh, what year was that building, the San Pedro City Hall? Yeah, I'm sure I'm surprised you don't know that. Well, I think it's 1930. I think it's 1930. Who's the architect, Joe? I don't know. I think it was P.K. Shabaram, but I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. So, but anyway, we'll look, check it out and see. But I think it's so important. One suggestion I did want to have, Mr. Busca, you know, uh, when you see that beautiful park up in Wilmington, find a suitable location to have the, you know, uh, Wilmington, Delaware, 3,221 miles, like Porter oh, for that. Like that. Like and then the I want you to cities. go to Delaware one day. It's just up the street from Washington. You're one of the top members of the uh, League of Cities, in the National League of Cities, and get a sign, Wilmington, California, from like a park that. there to connect the two. Because people don't realize Phineas Banning came from Wilmington, Delaware. You know why I know that, Joe? Why? When I was 24, I was on a train, and the Amtrak conductor said, Wilmington, Wilmington, Delaware. <laughs> and then he went on about Phineas Manning and all that stuff. <laughs> but he said it just like that, like tabulate the vote. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me say this, Mr. Chair. Um, one of the reasons why we wanted to have the TCT meeting here is to hear um, and listen to the update um, for our waterfront efforts in both San Pedro and Wilmington. And thank you, Dave, for your report. Um, and thank you, Ambassador, for your leadership and your colleagues for pressing forward on this. We, there's a sense of urgency in getting this done. We uh, are the last standing port that's not an attraction in this country. And um, 
along with the development team, I feel I strongly feel we need an international brand that's attached to this development that's going to drive people and money into this area. Um, and I just spoke at the San Pedro Chamber um, luncheon just last week and told them we need to move on this and get to yes to make this happen because it will just long overdue. And we're not going to wait another 10 years to get it done. Mr. Chair, I'd be happy to keep this running. This is Mr. Chair talking to you. <laughs> You're Mr. Chair of the redevelopment. <laughs> I'd like to have this every other month, if possible, or every three months, an update to keep the pressure on everybody to do yes. this. Because even, I do want to give you better credit. I think it's uh, more interesting than another port to the south of here, just a little south of here. Yeah. You know, because that's very an industrial port. This is very, there's a people's port here. And a community and a right. and a light. So let's let's, uh, Mr. S uh, City Clerk, uh, every three months let's have an update on this, and just keep it keep it on and then uh, keep it going because I think it's such a wonderful initiative. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Note and file. Next item. Item six is motion Buscaino Bonin introduced on April eighth, twenty fourteen which proposes that council ask the Harbor Department to report to this committee with an overview of the department's monetary and in-kind donations, including below market leases to nonprofit organizations uh, with an accompanying explanation of the public benefits. We have one public comment card, Mr. Ken Melendez. Thank you, Mr. Melendez. Uh, thank you for the time again. Um, I've heard this already at the, Har the Harbor Commission meeting a couple of weeks ago. It's an excellent report, and I do recommend that the two of you find out what percentage of that $25 million, I believe, is the budget every year is being spent. Start all over, Ken. I'm sorry. I missed, okay. I missed your first part. Uh, first of all, um, I heard this report two Harbor Commission meetings ago, okay? It's an excellent report. And one of the things... Uh, I would like you to do is to find out what percentage of the, I believe it's $25 million, and she, uh, Cynthia can cor correct me if I'm wrong, is going to San Pedro and what percentage is going to Wilmington. The second thing that happened after this report was a, was a presentation about where port operations are, and you'll find that it's in Wilmington and Terminal Island uh, where the money's made. Um, the other thing I want to mention to you real briefly, too, is the Wilmington Marina open, that's true. I wrote the motion on it as a member of PCAC. It's part of a settlement, okay? So that's an example of San Pedro people suing the port, getting the money, and sharing it with Wilmington, and that's where that, pro that project comes from. The other the point I want to make real quick, and then I'll get out of your hair because I know it's late. Um, this is LA Waterfront. You know, we're told all the time that there's, no, there's not any money on the Wilmington side in here. You, the Wilmington Marina is mentioned, once again, it's a court-ordered settlement project. Uh, you have the $40 million water cut in San Pedro, which I totally support, and you also have Alta C. I think the port share of that is about between 50 and $60 million. So once again, I'm just getting right back to, uh, in Wilmington, they need, we need fair share. We need the Wilmington waterfront moving forward, not sitting uh, stale anymore. Thank you very much for the time. Thank you, Mr. Mendez. Thanks, Ken. Ms. Ruiz. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Cynthia Ruiz, and I am Deputy Executive Director of External Relations here at the Port of Los Angeles. So with the Port of Los Angeles, our mission statement is that we are America's port. We're the number one container port, and then we are the global leader for sustainability, security, and social responsibility. So what I'm going to be speaking with you this afternoon about is our social responsibility piece. But I do want to give a quick shout out. We do have a president of our neighborhood council, Dave Behar, from the Coastal Neighborhood, San Pedro Neighborhood Council is here. So I just wanted to acknowledge him. Dave, stand up. I think he stepped oh, out. Oh, he just left. He just, he just left. All right, okay, Dave, you're well, a great guy, Dave. We <laughs> wanted to let you know we want to honor you. 
So he snuck out. So first of all, I wanted to kind of give you perspective about our annual community benefit. And this chart shows from 2010, 2011 to our, our upcoming fiscal year. So the, what you see in blue is actually dollars that are out of the port's pocket. And what the red shows is in-kind. So we both have in-kind support and we actually have um, monetary support as well. So if you look at the upcoming fiscal year, 1415, total dollar amount is 38.5 million. 22.9 of that is actually hard dollars, and 15.6 of that is money that is in kind. And I'll talk about that in a minute. So if you look at, you might ask yourself the question, well, 2010, 2011 looks a lot higher versus now. And a few years ago, that's when we were doing a lot of our capital programs. You heard earlier about the Wilmington Waterfront Park. You know, in the last few years, the Port of Los Angeles has actually developed 50 acres of open space between the 22nd Street Park Wilmington Waterfront Park, and I know you know Councilmember Lodge, Councilmember LaBanche, 50 acres of open space is pretty good. Right. So um, for our upcoming year, as I indicated, it's 38.5, and this is the breakdown, uh, recreational and park facilities, capital improvement, uh, port park facility maintenance, sponsorship program, and that's what I'm going to talk about in a few minutes, educational programs, red car operation, waterfront fountain and promenade, rent agreements, and recreational properties. So recreational and park facilities, that's our great Cabrillo Marine, Marine Aquarium, the uh, Cabrillo Beach parking and the lifeguards there, the Los Angeles Maritime Museum, Point Furman Lighthouse, and other recreational and park operated facilities in our area. Our capital improvement for next year is $3.4 million. So it's actually 4.8. 3.4 of that's going to Los Angeles Waterfront. That's for Alta Sea Design, the Downtown Harbor Cut. Although the Downtown Harbor Cut will be opening on June 20th, we actually have money that's uh, billed to us after and we'll be paying next year, next fiscal year. We also have Port Park Facility Maintenance at 4.4. That's for the Harbor Boulevard Parkway, the cruise ship promenade area, 22nd Street Park, and Port Security Services at $1.4 million. So sponsorship and programs. So our sponsorship budget is $1.5 million, and then we have an additional 154000 in community of events. Cynthia, I'm sorry. Can you go to the last slide? Absolutely. Um, explain the port security services. Now that's um, port a PD, foot port police, beats, bike officers. Right. So um, as you know, council member, we have a lot of community events from our Cars and Stripes, right. Lobster Fest, and that's uh, money that's used to have the port police staff those events. Very good. And we have the best port law enforcement maritime in the world here. Here. We absolutely and we do. have, I think, I saw Chief Boyd earlier. Maricela, thanks for doing the wave. <laughs> our, our port officers, if you're listening, we love you. Thank you for your service. We do, and Chief Boyd is the best. So sponsorship programs, um, what we've decided to do with our $1.5 million, we decided to make that more open and transparent. So a million dollars out of that $1.5, we have decided um, well, this talks about our educational programs. Educational programs are international trade uh, education, ITEP that we're very familiar with, our top sale program, which actually takes um, youth out on the tall ships and teaches them about teamwork. That's a great program. We also have contract services to operate the red car. It costs $1.2 million a year, and our waterfront fountain uh, to maintain that on a contractual basis is $700,000 a year. So our um, this is the in-kind reduced rent or rent-free agreements. That The va doc dollar value on that is $5.1 million. So reduced rate rent at USS Iowa, Pacific Maritime Association, Eastview Little League, the Boys and Girls Club gets free rent, and the the Boys Scouts of America also gets free rent. So 
the meat of this is our $1.5 million in sponsorship. So, Tim, I'm sorry, maybe Jack Hedge, I don't know if he's still here. What is the uh, status of the L.A. Council of Boy Scouts of America, their lease? That hasn't been solidified yet. Thanks, Jack. Jack Hedge, the Director of Real Estate. Thanks, Cynthia. Good afternoon, Councilman. Uh, sure. Actually, we're planning to go out for an, an RFP for that site, uh, and we fully expect Boy Scouts will be one of the respondents, but we plan to go out for an RFP for that Timeline site. on that, do we know? In the next few months, we just approved what we call the green sheet, which is the preliminary approval process internally. To get that approved, it should be on the street very shortly. Thank you, sir. Yes. Let me ask you a question. Uh, just a question. Boy Scouts, you, they got a, a good, fair shot to continue that because I think the Boy Scouts are important, as the Girl Scouts are. Yes. I, I believe I believe they do. I, yes, they've been a good Nobody tenant. Nobody pushing them out. No, they've been a good tenant. They've been oh, a tenant in okay, good standing, good. but we have a number of, of, of qualified, we believe, groups that have expressed interest in it, and we believe it's in the best interest of the of the city and the and the Tidelands to give a lot of people a fair shot at it. I got it, but the Boy Scouts, have, over 100 years, have been making a difference, and they're transforming, so I just want to let you know. I do have a fair shot. I was shot. a scout, and I'm sure we, we know where Tom stands. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> they have a fair shot, sir. So uh, at the last commission meeting, our uh, commission has given us permission to use our, our um, sponsorship dollars in a more open and transparent way, and we're going to turn that into a grant program. We did a pilot program on the grants last year, and it was very successful. So out of the pot of $1.5 million, $1 million of that will go to a grant-based model. And the reason the whole bucket's not going, we did want to keep some money in the sponsorship for our business development, our port police, and our engineering that have events that they attend. So through our grant program, we have to make sure that it meets at least one of our program goals, which it has to pertain to the LA waterfront, environment, international trade, jobs, safety, security, maritime history, sustainability, or have overall community benefit. So as I just indicated, $100 will be, $100, hundred million dollars excuse me a little bit different million dollars will be available and actually the grant applications are available now we're going to have small medium and large grants we're going to divide it up into two sessions so there'll be an initial session this spring because this program will take a place next fiscal year uh, it's not all what well, the applications will be online but then they can either um, download them and fill them out and bring them into us or mail them into us. Um, I'm not sure, and I can check on that if they can completely fill it out on, online. But we're trying to get more tech friendly. This, this gives you the timeline, so the applications are now available. We, one thing we did learn through the pilot program is that we want to have workshops to really educate the community. Applications for the first round are due June 2nd, and then we will have a review panel and award the first round of grants on June 19th. Board going to every neighborhood council that has the benefit to reach out to try to, they're, they're going there. Uh, yes, so absolutely. All right, so good. Just all you got to say is yes. yes. Of course. Round, round two is this fall. And that concludes my presentation. I'm more than happy to answer any questions. Explain the wor workshop coming up in a couple days on these grants. So basically, we want to make sure that we have two workshops, one in San Pedro and one in Wilmington, because we want to reach out to both communities. And they're educational workshops. And I I'll tell you where we actually got that from. The Harbor Community Benefit Foundation, through their grant program, we watched what they did. Their workshops were very successful. It's basically just going through the application itself and working with the nonprofits on how to fill out that application. Nice. Thank so it's you. educational. I also wanted to say I know uh, years ago, maybe 30 years ago, the Port of Los Angeles uh, revitalized the lagoon in San Diego. And I just wanted to let staff know that it's very nice for San Diego, but there's some lagoons up river in Los Angeles on the Los Angeles River. There's Ferndale and other areas that you want to look at. So if there's some mitigation you have to do, I think it all had to do with Pier 400 even before that of dredging out. We have a lot of work in Los Angeles County that we could do on that. Wow. So have you ever seen that, Joe? I did not. It's a nice sign. Well, this have a trip to San Diego to rededicate that work <laughs> that you guys did. <laughs> sure, that happened Same way day. before we got here. 
And so the final piece of that, I know that Mr. Melendez asked about as we move forward next fiscal year, what percentage of that money is Wilmington and what percentage is San Pedro. I'll be more than happy to look into that and report back. Thank, Thank you, you so Cynthia, much. for your work and your <laughs> service Thanks, to Los Angeles. Uh, I have no other cards in front of me. We've completed the agenda. Is that correct? Wish everybody well. Give a shout out to Mr. Hillman, the former LAPD commander who's here. At, does such a great job for all of Los Angeles. You, oh, Mr. Chair. Yes. Uh, um, item number six approved. Approved certainly. We don't do anything, but we don't approve. Okay. Everybody have a great day. Continue to serve the city well. Thank you. Good afternoon.